Hey guys, it's Edward. So today, I'm going to give you an example of how I do the system design interview and how I practice and think about these questions. In my last video, I created a template to approach the system design interview. I provided proper justification for the process, shared with you some resources that I use to prepare for the system design interview and how to use them. And these are all resources and approaches that I recommend, not just for myself, but to my clients. Now the overall process here and the fundamental idea is to iterate over and over again on our system, addressing any inefficiencies or pain points that we might suffer from the end user or our own decisions. And that whatever topic that we cannot understand, come up with, or have a good clear answer for, we will read that relevant section of DDIA. Keep in mind, this is a basic template and just an exercise to ensure that you can actually dive in and understand and justify any decision that you make when actually doing the system design interview. There are many different approaches and heuristics that you can do to improve upon this and maybe in the future you will apply your own. But the fundamental idea of solving inefficiencies and iterating over a system is the exact same no matter how high level you get. This video is focused on proving that this basic idea and this basic approach will work and in the future we will go into more nuanced and complete examples. So let's actually put this into practice. And at the end of the video, I'll show you some of the heuristics I use to get through the problem faster. So with that, let's begin. So this problem we're going to do is to design a URL shortening service like tinyurl. The numbers and situations I will be using here will be taken from grokking the system design for convenience. So remember that our first step here is to design the basic high level end to end solution. The user will submit a URL and return back a hashed version of that URL as the idea of our domain URL. So for instance, maybe facebook.com resolves to tinyurl.abc or something like that. When the user submits that URL to our domain, we want to redirect the user to the original website. So this will probably mean that we have some kind of persistent storage like a database. And so this is our minimum viable product, supposing that we only had one user to actually interact with, with the system. So this is not necessarily that bad, but there are definitely a lot of limitations to the problem. We need to know a few metrics and a few parameters that will require our attention. So now, what is our current pain point or unknown? Well, how many users that we have to service or the parameters of the problem itself? So the first thing we don't know is how many URLs we need to store. We cannot possibly store every single URL in the universe, at least, well, in theory we could, but for our own purposes, it effectively is impossible. This can be a function of the size of the ID space. This can be another artificial limitation, but this also leads us to what hashing algorithm we may or may not use. The second thing we don't actually know is our time to live, which is a consequence of number one. After all, once we've filled out our storage space, well, how do we make room for more URLs? We need to have some rule to purge the existing URLs, whether that is age or popularity. And now the final rule that we are going to need to be able to handle is how many requests are we going to get? This is going to affect our read and write and server operations. We can be even more specific and split the read and write operations separately if we need to. Any other metric at this point, I would argue, is irrelevant. This is because we don't actually know enough about the system that we are building. For additional features, they are built on top of this fundamental core idea. And so we can acknowledge them for now, like for instance, user controlled deletion, but these are not core to the central system and therefore we shouldn't immediately handle them yet. This is also probably where a candidate might make the first mistake of naming a particular hashing algorithm. They may roll MD5 or SHA-1 off the tongue, but as I mentioned before, this means that you're dismissing not only all the other hashing algorithms, but any other problems that might be vital or core to the problem. Not to mention, you don't even know if this little detail, this hashing algorithm that you are designed to use and commit to is absolutely vital to your system at all this early on. The context in which you propose these solutions is absolutely relevant. And for people who are used to just writing code and moving on, this can seem like a foreign concept. Also, we will have a few fundamental issues with hashing collisions and other things in the system later on. So we'll address those later. But for now, let's get the bare bones on the table. Let's hand wave some of the math and suppose that the interviewer gave you these parameters. Note that the numbers I'm gonna give you here are arbitrary. So let's keep this simple for now. And suppose that we want to keep six alphanumeric characters upper and lowercase. Therefore, this gets us the two times 26 that you see here, uh, plus 10, which represents the number of numbers. And so you have six possible combinations of those. This approximately leads to about 56 gigabytes of IDs in the pool. 
Now, you also are going to need to store the URLs associated with them. Assuming 500 bytes per URL, this means you have about 28 terabytes that you need to deal with. So this is going to be our leading factor, the 28 terabytes. The second thing we want to answer is the time to live, right? So let's suppose that it's going to be time to live by age, where we retire the URLs by a week, a month, a year, it doesn't matter, just some arbitrary date that we decide. And the third thing we should consider is the operations. Uh, we are approximately going to get about a 100 to 1 read to write. Why? Because most users are actually going to be resolving URLs much more than they are going to be creating them. If we think about how a user might actually interact with the system, then this actually kind of makes more sense. And with 500 million URLs shortened every single month, we can probably guess that we're going to get about 20,000 requests per second off the top of our head. And even if you didn't really account for this, you can at least assume that you will have a very high volume of traffic. So now, what is our current pain point or unknown? The most prevalent pain point that we see and I've mentioned before is the number of requests per second and the size of the data. Now, 28 terabytes of data is actually not that bad and we can kind of table that discussion for now. After all, a few trips to Best Buy will actually suffice and solve the problem. The real issue that we are encountering here is what the individual users can expect from us in terms of service. That is, what are the problems associated with servicing a high number of requests? We expect the service to at least have high availability, the redirection should be done with minimal latency, and the URL should not necessarily be guessable. With this guessable requirement, we may want to expand our ID pool and add two more dummy bytes, where these two dummy bytes will represent just salting in the URL. And this would increase our size to approximately 1200 terabytes or so. This would be the point where we want to ask the interviewer if this requirement is necessary to discard it or to dive deeper into the math and see if we even need the dummy bytes. But this is also a tangent that can also be tabled if the interviewer decides to lead one way or the another. The point here is that we want to ask this question because it is a reasonable user behavior that a user might actually expect from our system. After all, if they resolve A, B, C, D, E, then arbitrarily we might not want to let a random user who plugged that in to actually be able to redirect there. We want a user to be deliberate with the URLs that they plug in. And so salting by some number of IDs or by some number of alphanumeric uh, digits is actually going to help us accomplish this. But we still need to address the high availability and low latency issue. We cannot answer these currently because we need to be able to translate the URL into its original URL. And certainly keeping 28 terabytes in memory, or in this case 200 terabytes in memory, is actually impossible, which means that we need to have a database. So then what is preventing us from coming up with a solution for these requirements? The first two requirements, availability and redirection, both depend on what the request response contract looks like and how they are processed. Are there any crazy processing operations we need to support? Well, the request to manipulate the URL at a bare basic level is just going to be creating URL and deleting a URL. We can add fancy options later on like a custom alias or plugging in a custom time to live. While deleting a URL is not necessarily part of the system right now, it's still reasonably expected and we can table that discussion. After all, a user should be able to delete a URL if they own it. So the requests so far are going to look pretty simple. There's nothing here that we need to consider as blocking so far. So let's actually dive in and actually create our system and dive into the individual components. So what is the current pain point? So the current pain point, like I mentioned before, is the number of URLs that we are storing, 200 terabytes. And this can actually affect the ability to handle these requests. After all, if we have 200 terabytes of data, we want to effectively and efficiently go through the data and retrieve the URL that when the user actually looks it up. And we want to have very fast inserts. And having a huge database can actually affect this. So since the requests are relatively simple, the current pain point will be actually in translating the URL to URL and vice versa, the creation and deletion of these URLs to a single table, or at least a single database. If we do this, we can also load balance the request in some ways, but this requires us to know how we're going to set up the servers and therefore how we're going to set up our database backend and sharding. So no matter which way you cut this, all roads lead to Rome, and this is the first thing that we need to absolutely address. Plus, it is the lowest hanging fruit. So then, what is preventing us from coming up with a solution for these requirements, if there are any? Well, we must answer the question, what does our database look like? So let's actually look at the schema and what relationship each one of these fields will have. We have an ID, an original URL, a created time, and expired time. Now we could replace the created time and expired time with a time to live. But in this case, I'd rather we just keep a created and expired time simply because having a time to live might actually change in the future. 
And if we decide to change it in the future, we have to change it on every single row in the database. And that can actually be a little bit hazardous. Not to mention, we still need to have created time at least. So that way we know how far in the future we can actually purge these items. This is a suitable candidate for a MySQL database. If we assume that we receive 20,000 read or write requests per second, this allows us to fill our high availability and minimal latency contract. We could also go for a NoSQL database as well, but this discussion requires us to have a comparison of alternatives. Again, don't start naming databases unless you're ready to have a good deep dive discussion. But at the very least, you can identify the characteristics of a good database. And in this case, something simple, something clean will be perfectly fine. Now, if we do need to shard the database, we can either do this by evenly distributing the URLs across the tables. This can mean hashing the URLs and sharding them by alphanumeric groups. In this case, we want to have the IDs and then shard by them. So the first maybe 10 alphanumeric IDs will be go to one shard and then next shard and the next shard and so on and so forth. I've annotated this here as A to M and N to Z to simulate as if we had sharded it into two places. The other way that we could potentially be able to shard this is by access. After all, if we have things that are very high access and we have very low access, then we could balance out the activity simply by doing a Swiss style tournament and putting the high and low popularity ones out onto the same shard. So that way there is no one hot shard. It just depends on what a potential user activity will look like, but proposing these two alternatives now is not going to affect our overall system. After all, this is just one unit of work that is contained to the database. For now, let's assume the simpler solution, hashing the URLs to themselves and splitting by alphanumeric IDs. This can actually help us in the future, and if this solution does not work, we at least have another one that we can fall back to that is a little bit more verbose. But I like this first one first because going with the simplest solution first is almost always the best idea. So now that we have this, let's go back to our original problem, the number of requests that we're receiving. How are we going to handle the IDs? After all, if we just go to some kind of hashing algorithm, then we will eventually run out of hashes. We're given enough requests or given enough requests that we have already processed. How do we want to handle this? We can hash and then check to see if that key exists in the database. And if we haven't, we grant it. But you know, we could potentially be constantly hitting the database as we fill it up and have consumed more and more IDs. This is not a great el or elegant solution because we would be locking the database just to do hashing validation. So what is our current pain point? So now that we know that we're going to have to be storing the URLs and sending them back, the next point is when we have enough traffic that our hashing may actually create collisions. We may keep running the hashing algorithm over and over again, salting the URL there until there are no more collisions, but this could theoretically continue ad finitum, or maybe querying the database for all these used keys. But both of these are terribly inefficient. There must be a better solution. Let's pre-compute the keys instead and store them in a key pool, not unlike caching. We will instead generate the keys and create a pool of available keys as IDs. The server will withdraw from the pool and every single time a URL gets deleted per the time to live, a key will be returned to the pool of keys. Now there are some issues with this. After all, if the pool contains all the keys that are used and unused, we would need to be very strict. That read and write should be maintained by the same lock. After all, if the key is returned to the pool, it can be available for another server to use. This gets into a whole discussion of being able to handle concurrency, but we can at least address this now, or at least acknowledge that it exists. The pool will be limited in its capacity, so as to not demand more keys than necessary. It will keep some of the keys in memory, and then keep the rest in disk. We can even do some math here to determine the amount, but for our purposes, let's leave that detail out. With all that said and done, we can now formally identify the error scenario. If a hashed URL is called and the URL is expired, we send the user to a 404 page. Not to mention, if we want to generate a URL, we actually satisfy our requirement for high availability and high redirection. After all, just simply going to the key pool, requesting a key, and then deleting that row is pretty fast in terms of operations. So let's go back to our original idea, the number of requests. How we resolve this? Well, not really, not at least completely. After all, there are plenty of other problems in the system. After all, we cannot constantly keep hitting the database over and over again each time we want to read for a URL. You know, there might be some hot URLs and having to constantly query the database for the resolution of that is actually going to be a bottlenecking problem. So in this case, we're going to need to introduce some caching. So what is our current pain point from having a high number of requests? There are a few left to handle, but one here is that there is a high rate of traffic going through the system. 
This means that we can potentially choke the database on so many read and write requests and that we may choke the server load. Let's handle each one of these one by one. The first one here is caching. Let's use the idea about the most popular URLs, but instead of sharding, we use it for URLs. We can have an in-memory cache that is akin to a hash map and use an LRU eviction policy. As URLs become less popular, they become evicted from the cache. So we can use Redis or Memcache in order to handle this. When a URL gets invalidated from the cache, we invalidate it in the database and trigger returning that key to the pool. This does lead to some weird issues where a key that is immediately retired could redirect to a new URL, leading to some confusion in the wild. But it is very unlikely by balance of probability that a key that is retired immediately becomes used right after. The other issue that we kind of run into here is actually with load balancing. Now, how to handle the amount of content and traffic coming through the system? The databases have been handled with some level of caching, but if we want to be completely bulletproof, we also need to be able to handle the servers themselves. After all, funneling all the requests to a single server is going to choke the server load. Load balancers work by redirecting traffic and fortunately for us, since all the servers are homogenous, we can just split the load evenly and do a round robin system for doing a load balancer. In a more complex system, we may want to be more judicious, like splitting the load via tournament style. Finally, we may also want to consider putting a load balancer in front of the caches as well. This makes things a little bit more complex and I'll leave this as an exercise for the viewers. Ask yourself, what kind of problems do you encounter with the load balancer? I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with every single cache that may or may not actually be the same across different cache instances. But the bottom line is this, we will still run into the same issue of every single request being funneled into the database cache. So let's actually walk through the way a user might actually use the service and see if our final design actually matches up. When a user actually creates a URL and gives an original URL here like facebook.com, it will go through a load balancer and select one of the homogenous application servers. Then it will try and retrieve one of the keys and request the keys from this key database. After that, it'll plug it into the relational database and return back the key that we have actually selected here, which is this ABC potentially. And therefore the end user will have received the tiny URL resolution. So if we plug in the tiny URL here, it will go to the load balancer, then application server, and then it will actually go and look at one of these caches. Now, if there are hot URLs that are commonly used, then most likely it will find it here, provided that this ABC is one of those re frequently used um, elements or frequently used URLs. And it will evict the, least re the LRU, the least recently used um, URL in here. And then if it doesn't actually find it in the cache, it'll pull it into a relational database and then pull it into the cache and return. And so once we actually have this whole flow going, then we need to be able to retire some of these URLs once they're used. This is where our retire key service comes in and it will actually query for all the keys in the relational database that have been expired based on the creation URL and time to live. And so based on the schema, it's going to actually just query by expire time. And if the expire time is greater than our current time, then we will go ahead and retire this URL and ID. This ID will come back to our key pool and then available for another server to actually request. So now that we actually come up with our solution, let's actually check our solution against grokking the coding interview and see if we've actually come up with something similar. And it turns out we actually have. Now that we've actually built up our answer, what are some heuristics that I use in order to be faster at this? Well, the first thing I want you to notice is that I actually use the cap theorem as my guiding compass, well, at least implicitly. I personally find this as a quite useful choice since it is actually very deterministic. Most of the time in scalable systems, we are forced to choose P out of the cap theorem because we want our system to work well because we don't want network interruptions to disrupt our system or partitions. This leaves us a choice with choosing either consistency or availability as our top priority. This brings me to the second heuristic, knowing what's likely to break on the previous computation. It's more or less the same question as asking what the inefficiency or pain point is, but it is much more directional in that you already know what decision caused your current situation and it narrows down the area you need to look. In this case, I identified that the huge amount of storage is going to actually be one of our biggest issues, but that was only because we actually did the math on it. And in a real interview, doing the math can be a little bit tedious. So in a real interview, I would have actually picked the key generation to actually be my top priority. Now I can mention in passing all the different ways of sharding the database if I believe that the data set will be too big. I don't necessarily need to do the huge computations that you saw early on, like with determining 56 gigabytes to 200 terabytes, but I should at least acknowledge that this is a possibility. 
Most of these heuristics are very simple, but they boil down simply to just knowing instinctively that given your current system and how it's run and how it's being used by the end user, what kind of abuse will it go through? That's pretty much the question at hand for me, but it's not unlike asking myself what the inefficiency is. We have pretty much arrived at a similar answer as the people from Grokking, albeit some help from the math department, purely through logic and this whole system of asking ourselves what the inefficiency is. And all we did was just keep unblocking ourselves as we tried to resolve the requirements of the system in a bare bones way, acknowledging which were priorities and which were just the bells and whistles. Notice here at no point do we necessarily commit ourselves to a specific technology until we know that it fits our needs. Rather, we identify characteristics of the system, component, or even the algorithm that we want. We make no commitment to it until we've sufficiently reasoned that our system can achieve a stable state in its current form, provided it fits the mold and our requirements. Let's use our hashing as an example. In the beginning, we believed that we would use some kind of hashing algorithm for this. A noob would just jump into what hashing algorithm do we use instead of seeing the bigger picture, namely, are we going to use the hashing algorithm in this way? Choosing the algorithm does not actually give us more options in choosing our system components or reveal any further insight into what we need to do. At best, it distracts us and at worst, it constrains us. It is only when we reason that there is a key collision problem that may have an adverse effect on our system that we invent our key pool. At that point, hashing algorithms almost become irrelevant. So whoever started off the system design with a discussion on MD5 versus SHA-1 hashing algorithms actually failed the interview. The second here is that the calculations and estimations serve as a litmus test for the possible pain points you will encounter. As another thing to note is that every single decision I made is a consequence of the previous decision. That is, this decision opens itself to questions and observations that immediately need to be discovered and resolved. Finally, the entire process was just a systematic routine of let's do the basics first and go back and add more stuff and unblock ourselves. Now, I know this video is long, so I recommend you rewatch this a few times so you can really understand the logic and thought process of what I just did. In the next video, I'll give an example of how I learned my mistakes in the system design interview and judge my answers. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure the next job offer or get some career counseling, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.